Bomb by Steve Schenken. Prologue, May 22, 1950. He had a few more minutes to destroy 17 years of evidence. Still in pajamas, Harry Gold raced around his cluttered bedroom, pulling out desk drawers, tossing boxes out of the closet, and yanking books from the shelves. He was horrified. Everywhere he looked were incriminating papers, a plane ticket stub, a secret report, a letter from a fellow spy. Gold ripped the papers to shreds, carried two fistfuls to the bathroom, shoved them into the toilet, and flushed. Then he ran back to his bedroom, grabbed the rest of the pile, and stumbled on slippers down the stairs to the cellar, where he pushed the stuff to the bottom of an overflowing garbage can. The doorbell rang. Gold walked to the door. He took a few deep breaths, trying to slow his heartbeat, then opened the door and saw the men he expected. Federal Bureau Investigation Agents Scott Miller and Richard Brennan. They'd been questioning Gold for days, showing him pictures of known spies, demanding information about his connection to these people. Gold had admitted nothing, insisting he was what he appeared to be, a simple, hard-working chemist who lived with his father and brother and had never been far from his Philadelphia home. Unconvinced, the FBI agents had come to search his house. Gold led the way to his room. Agent Miller sat down at Gold's desk and started opening drawers, sifting through paper piles. Brennan went to work on the sagging bookshelves, packed tight with math and science volumes and stacks of paperback novels. Brennan flipped through a paperback, stopping to inspect something stamped on the inside cover. The name of a department store in Rochester, New York. What's this? He asked Gold, holding open the book. Oh, I don't know, Gold said. Must have picked it up at a used book counter somewhere. Lord knows where. Then, from a desk drawer, Miller pulled a train schedule for the Washington, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Boston passenger line. Another clue that Gold wasn't the homebody he'd described. What's this, Harry? Miller asked. Goodness knows, Gold said, shrugging. I probably picked it up when I went to New York. This is bad, he said to himself. Bad, but not terrible. Then, came the body blow. Gold watched Brennan slide a thick, tattered copy of Principles of Chemical Engineering from the shelf. Nausea swelled Gold's throat as he saw a light brown folded street map drop to the floor. To Gold, the map seemed to scream its title in the silent room. New Mexico, land of enchantment. Oh, God, he thought. So, you were never west of the Mississippi, said Brennan, bending down to lift the map. He opened it and saw, at the spot in Santa Fe where the Castillo Street Bridge crosses the Santa Fe River, an X marked in ink. How about this, Harry? demanded Brennan. Miller spun from the desk, stood, and watched Gold. Gold needed to speak quickly, needed to offer an explanation, but he froze. Give me a minute, he managed, falling heavily into his desk chair. Brennan offered him a cigarette, which he took. Brennan lit it, and Gold drew deeply. A torrent of thoughts poured through my mind, Gold later said of, the mo of this moment. The map could easily be explained. He'd just say he loved Western stories, which was true, and that, out of curiosity, he'd sent to a Santa Fe museum for the map. Surely they didn't keep records of such requests. No one could prove he was lying. But then he thought about what would happen if he continued claiming innocence. My family, people with whom I worked, and my friends whom I knew my lifetime friends, they would all rally around me. And how horrible would be their disappointment and the letdown when it finally was shown who I really was. Harry Gold had been living a double life for 17 years. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, he turned to the FBI agents. They were still waiting for an answer. Yes, I am the man, Gold said. He slumped a little lower in his chair. There's a great deal more to this story. It goes way back, he said. I would like to tell it all. Skinny Superhero Harry Gold was right. This is a big story. It's the story of the creation, and theft, of the deadliest weapon ever invented. The scene speed around the world, from secret labs to commando raids to street corner spy meetings. But like most big stories, this one starts small. Let's pick up the action 16 years before FBI agents cornered Harry Gold in Philadelphia. Let's start 3,000 miles to the west, in Berkeley, California, on a chilly night 
in February 1934. On a hill high above town, a man and a woman sat in a parked car. In the driver's seat was a very thin young physics professor named Robert Oppenheimer. Beside him sat his date, a graduate student named Melba Phillips. The two looked out of the view of San Francisco Bay. It was a fine view, but Oppenheimer couldn't stay focused on his date. He turned to Phillips and asked, Are you comfortable? She said she was. Mind if I get out and walk for a few minutes? She didn't mind. Oppenheimer got out and strolled into the darkness. Phillips wrapped a coat around her legs and waited. She waited a long time. At some point, she fell asleep. She woke up in the middle of the night. The seat beside her was still empty. Worried, she stepped out onto the road and waved down a passing police car. My escort went for a walk hours ago and he hasn't returned, she told the cop. The police searched the park but found nothing. They notified headquarters and a wider search was begun. An officer drove to Oppenheimer's apartment to look for useful clues. He found the professor in bed, sound asleep. The cop shook Oppenheimer awake and demanded an explanation. Oppenheimer said he'd gotten out of the car to think about physics. I just walked and walked, he said, and I was home and I went to bed. I'm so sorry. A reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle got hold of the story and wrote an article with the headline, Forgetful Prof Parks Girl Takes Self Home. No one who knew Robert Oppenheimer was the least bit surprised. He'd always been different. A girl who knew Robert as a child in New York City described him as very frail, very pink-cheeked, very shy, and very brilliant. Oppenheimer was a tougher critic. A repulsively good little boy, he said of himself. My life as a child did not prepare me for the fact that the world is full of cruel and bitter things. He was constantly getting sick, so his nervous parents tried to protect him by keeping him inside. While other boys played in the street, Robert sat alone in his room studying languages, devouring books of literature and science, and filling notebooks with poetry. Around kids his age, he was awkward and quiet, never knowing what to say unless he could bring the conversation around to books. Then he would let loose annoying bursts of learning. Ask me a question in Latin, he'd say, and I'll answer you in Greek. Hoping to toughen up their skinny stick, 14-year-old, Robert's parents sent him to a sports summer camp. But he was an awful athlete and simply refused to participate. Then the other campers found out that he wrote home every day and that he liked poetry and looked looking for minerals. That's when they started calling him Cutie. Robert never fought back. He never even responded. That made his tormentors even angrier. One night after dinner, Robert went for a walk. A group of boys waited for him in the woods. They grabbed him, dragged him to the ice house, and tossed him on the rough wood floor. They ripped off his shirt and pants, dipped brush, a brush in green paint, and slapped the dripping bristles against his bony body. Robert never said a word about the attack to camp counselors. I don't know how Robert stuck out those remaining weeks, his only friend at camp would later say. Not many boys would have, or could have. But Robert did. It must have been hell for him. Science saved him. Robert dove into deep into chemistry and physics in high school, graduated from Harvard University in 1925, then earned advanced degrees at top universities in Britain and Germany. Even in classes with some of the brightest students in the world, Oppie, as friends called him, never lost his know-it-all style. He interrupted physics lectures with his own theories, sometimes charging to the chalkboard, grabbing the chalk and declaring, this could be done much better in the following manner. Classmates got so annoyed, they actually signed a petition asking him to allow others to speak in class. After that, Oppenheimer calmed down. A little bit. The trouble, a friend said, is that Oppie is so quick on the trigger intellectually that he puts the other guy at a disadvantage. He'd lucked into a thrilling time in theoretical physics. Uh, physicists were just beginning to figure out what atoms look like and how the tiny particles inside them move and affect each other. Theoretical physicists were the explorers of their day, using their imagination and mind-bending math to dig deeper and deeper into the surprising inner workings of atoms. Oppenheimer knew he'd found his calling. When he returned to the States, schools all over the country tried to hire him. He picked the University of California in Berkeley, where he quickly built the country's best theoretical physics program. 
Students who came to study with Oppenheimer quickly realized they were in for a wild ride. When you took questions to him, one student remembered, he would spend hours, until midnight perhaps, exploring every angle with you. He generally would answer patiently, another student agreed, unless the question was manifestly stupid, in which event his response was likely to be quite caustic. While sitting in on other professors' lectures, Oppenheimer was known to squirm impatiently. Aw, oh, come on, he'd call out. We all know that. Let's get on with it. Oppenheimer's own lectures, according to a student named Edward Gerjoy, were lightning bursts of ideas, stories, and math on the blackboard. He spoke quite rapidly and puffed equally rapidly, Gerjoy said. When one cigarette burned down to a fragment he no longer could hold, he lit another. Oppenheimer paced as he lectured, his wiry black hair sticking straight up, his large blue eyes flashing as he furiously wrote, erased, wrote more, talked, puffed, and bobbed in and out in a cloud of white smoke. During one lecture, he told students to think about a formula he'd written. There were dozens scrawled all over the board, and a student cut in to ask which formula he was talking about. Not that one, Oppenheimer said, pointing to the blackboard. The one underneath. There was no formula below that one, so the student, the student pointed out. Not below, underneath, snapped Oppenheimer. I have written over it. As one of Oppenheimer's students put it, everyone sort of regarded him very affectionately as being sort of nuts. I need physics more than friends, Oppenheimer once told his younger brother. Lost in his studies, Oppenheimer paid little attention to the outside world. He didn't hear about the stock market crash that triggered the Great Depression until six months after it happened. He first voted in a presidential election in 1936 at the age of 32. Beginning in late 1936, my interest began to change, he later said. There were a few reasons. For one thing, the country's ongoing economic troubles began to hit home. I saw what the Depression was doing to my students. Often they could not get jobs, he said. And through them, I began to understand how deeply political and economic events could affect men's lives. I began to feel the need to participate more fully in the life of the community. Oppenheimer started going to political meetings and discussion groups. He began giving money to support causes like labor unions and striking farm workers. But it wasn't only the events in the United States that caught Oppenheimer's attention. It was also alarmed by the violent rise in Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party in Germany. Hitler took over as Chancellor of Germany in 1933 and started arresting political opponents and tossing them into concentration camps. With complete control of the country in his hands, Hitler began persecuting German Jews, stripping them of their legal rights, kicking them out of the universities and government jobs. Oppenheimer, who was Jewish, still had family in Germany, as well as Jewish friends from his student days. When he heard that Hitler was harassing Jewish physicists, Oppenheimer dedicated a portion of his salary to help them escape Nazi Germany. At the same time, the German dictator built up a huge military and started hacking out what he called a Greater Germany, a massive European empire that Hitler insisted rightfully belonged to Germans. He annexed neighboring Austria in 1938, then remanded a huge region of Czechoslovakia. Britain and France were strong enough to stand in Hitler's way, but they caved into his threats, hoping to preserve peace in Europe. This is my last territorial demand in Europe, Hitler promised. A few months later, he sent German troops into the rest of Czechoslovakia. Just 20 years after the end of World War I, it looked like a second world war was about to explode. Oppenheimer followed these terrifying events from his home in California, burning with what he described as a continuing, smoldering fury toward Adolf Hitler. But how was a theoretical physicist supposed to save the world? The U Business Actually, theoretical physicists were about to become more powerful than Oppenheimer had ever imagined. In late December 1938, in the German capital of Berlin, a chemist named Otto Hahn set up a new experiment in his lab. By the late 1930s, scientists like Hahn understood that everything in the universe is made up of incredibly tiny particles called atoms. They knew that atoms themselves are composed of even smaller particles. 
Atoms have a central core, or nucleus, made up of protons and neutrons packed tightly together. Surrounding the neutrons are electrons. Scientists also knew that some atoms are radioactive. That is, their nucleus is naturally unstable. Particles break away from the nucleus and shoot out at high speeds. This was useful to experimenters like Hahn because they could use radioactive elements as tiny cannons. Hahn began his experiment with a piece of silver-colored metal called uranium. He placed the uranium beside a radioactive element. He knew that neutrons would speed out of the radioactive material. He knew that some of these particles would hit uranium atoms. The big question was, what happens when a speeding neutron crashes into a uranium atom? The answer was shocking. Hahn was sure he'd made a mistake. As expected, some of the speeding neurons hit uranium atoms. What staggered Hahn was that the force of the collision seemed to be causing the uranium, atom, uranium atoms to split in two. According to everything scientists knew in 1938, this was impossible. At once excited and disturbed, Hahn needed help. He turned to his former partner, Lisa Meitner, a Jewish physicist who'd been forced out of Hitler by Germany by Hitler. Hahn wrote to Meitner at her new office in Sweden, describing the strange results of his experiment. Perhaps you can suggest some fantastic explanation, Hahn said of the splitting uranium. We understand that it really can't break up. Meitner responded immediately, agreeing that the news was amazing, but adding, we have experienced so many surprises in nuclear physics that one cannot say without hesitation about anything. It's impossible. A few days later, Meitner's nephew, Otto Frisch, also a physicist, came to Sweden for a visit. Over breakfast, she showed him Hahn's letter. I don't believe it, he said. There's some mistake. The two went outside to discuss the mystery. We walked up and down on the snow on Ion skis and she on foot, Frisch recalled. They talked over an idea proposed by the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr had recently suggested that the nucleus of an atom might act like a wobbly droplet of liquid. If that were true, they asked each other, what would happen if a speeding neuron hit the nucleus of a uranium atom? Could the force of the collision cause the uranium nucleus to stretch and stretch like a liquid drop until it split? They brushed the snow off a fallen log and sat. Meitner pulled out a scrap of paper and a pencil, and Frisch sketched a diagram of a circle sketching into a long oval shape and finally breaking in two. Yes, Meitner said. That is what I mean. They agreed. This must be what happened to the uranium atoms in Hahn's lab. Meitner took a pen and pencil and began working out the math. If you really do form such frag two such fragments, she said, they would be pushed apart with great energy. An atom splitting was incredible enough, but what made this world-changing discovery was that if atoms really could be split, they would release energy as they broke in two. How much energy? Just enough, Meitner and Frisch calculated, to make a grain of sand jump. That doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind how tiny atoms are. With 238 protons and neutrons, uranium is the largest atom in nature. Still, each atom is incredibly small. A single ounce of uranium has about 100, this looks like quadrillion, I don't know, there's a lot of zeros here, atoms. What if you had a 20-pound lump of uranium? A 50-pound lump? What if you were able to get all those atoms to split and release energy at the same moment? You'd have by far the most powerful bomb ever built. I feel as if I had caught an element by elephant by its tail without meaning to, Frisch wrote to his mother. And now, I don't know what to do with it. News of the discovery quickly spread within the small world of the theoretical physicists. Otto Frisch rushed to Copenhagen, Denmark, catching up with Niels Bohr just as Bohr was boarding a ship for America. Frisch began telling Bohr that uranium atoms could be split in two and was halfway through his explanation when Bohr slapped himself on the forehead. Oh, what idiots we all have been, shouted Bohr. Oh, but it is wonderful. This is just as it must be. Bohr was so excited, he ran home to get a blackboard. He set it up in his cabin on the ship, 
and spent most of the two-week Atlantic crossing exploring this new discovery. By the time he reached New York City in January 1939, he was convinced uranium atoms really could split in two. He took the news to a physics conference in Washington, D.C., where it leaped from one physicist to another. Bohr has just come in, one scientist announced. He has gone crazy. He says a neutron can, be, can split uranium. A newspaper reporter attending the conference described the news in a short article, which was picked up by papers across the country. The next morning, a young physicist named Louis Alvarez was sitting in a barber shop in Berkeley, California. While the barber snipped his hair, Alvarez grabbed the San Francisco Chronicle from a pile of papers beside the chair. In the second section, he remembered, buried away someplace was an announcement that some German temp chemists had found that the uranium atom split into two pieces. Alvarez put down the paper. I got right out of that barber chair and ran as fast as I could. He sprinted to the campus of the University of California, where he taught, and ran from lab to lab with the news, soon bumping into one of his fellow professors, Robert Oppenheimer. Alvarez told Oppenheimer that uranium atoms split in two. Scientists were calling it fission. That's impossible, Oppenheimer said. Alvarez explained what little he'd read about fission. Oppenheimer quickly agreed, it must be true. It was amazing to see how rapidly his mind worked, said Alvarez. The you business is unbelievable, Oppenheimer told a friend a few days later. You is the chemical symbol for uranium. Like all the scientists involved in the discovery, Oppenheimer was fired up by new ideas in physics, deeper glimpses into the weird inner world of atoms. The thought of making weapons of mass destruction had never occurred to him. But now, suddenly, he couldn't shake it from his mind. Fission might make it possible to build a whole new type of explosive. Within, within perhaps a week, recalls a student, there was on the blackboard in Robert Oppenheimer's office a drawing, a very bad and execrable drawing of a bomb. Robert Oppenheimer realized something else right away. If it was obvious to him that an atomic bomb might be possible, it was also obvious to everyone else in the global communi community of top physicists. This would not usually be a problem. In normal times, scientists from around the world freely shared new ideas and theories. But in 1939, normal times were rapidly coming to an end. Adolf Hitler was demanding a big piece of Poland, claiming it rightfully belonged to Germans. Britain and France finally faced the fact that Germany would continue gobbling up territory until stopped by force. At Poland, they drew the line. A German attack on Poland, they warned, would mean war with Britain and France. Hitler waved his fist and raged. I'll cook them in a stew they'll choke on. Calling his military chiefs to Berlin, Hitler announced, Further successes can no longer be obtained without the shredding of blood, shedding of blood. He ordered the German military to prepare an all-out invasion of Poland. Hitler knew this might ignite a much wider war, but he was not worried about taking the blame. In starting and waging a war, he told his generals, it is not right that matters, but victory. Close, close your hearts to pity. Act brutally. The stronger man is right. Finding Einstein On the hot, sunny morning of July 16, 1939, a Dodge Coupe pulled to the sandy side of the road in the oceanfront town of Patago, Pachago, New York. Out of the car climbed two sweat-soaked men. The men looked around, then began walking down the town's main streets. Speaking with European accents that locals couldn't quite identify, the visitors asked for directions to the cottage of Dr. Moore. No one in town knew of such a place. The men went into stores and gas stations. No luck. They hiked back to their car and collapsed into their seats. Perhaps I misunderstood the name Pachago on the telephone, the driver said. Let's see if we can find some similar name on the, on the map. Visibly irritated, the man in the passenger seat unfolded a map of Long Island. He ran his finger along town names in tiny print. Could it be Pekinik? Yes, that was it, the driver exclaimed. Now I remember. He started the engine. They got back on the road. Driving the car was Eugene Wigner. In the passenger seat sat Leo Slizzard. Both were Hungarian-born physicists, both about 40, 
both Jews who had fled to Europe as Adolf Hitler rose to power. Both were tormented by the same question. What had German scientists told Hitler about the possibility of building atomic bombs? They had no way of knowing, but this much was clear. Fission had been discovered in Berlin. Probably German physicists were already working on an atomic bomb. This was a terrifying thought, especially since six months had already passed since Hahn's discovery and the American president, Franklin Roosevelt, still had no idea that such a thing as fission even existed. Slizzard and Wigner were determined to help him. Step one of their plan was to find Albert Einstein, the world's most famous scientist. If Einstein sounded the alarm about the danger of a German atomic bomb, President Roosevelt might just listen. Wigner had called Einstein's office that morning. He was told the great man was on vacation, staying at a beach house he rented from someone named Dr. Moore in Pachigo. Or was it Peconic? Something with a P. About an hour after leaving, leaving Pachigo, uh, Wigner and Slizzard pulled out of Peconic. Once again, they asked around for the home of Dr. Moore. Again, no one knew. Let's give it up and go home, Slizzard said, sighed. Perhaps fate never, in, never intended it. Wigner shook his head. But it is our duty to take this step, he insisted. It must be our contribution to the prevention of a terrible calamity. So they drove slowly on, passing dunes and cottages. Slizzard had an idea. How would it be if we simply asked where around here Einstein lives? Wigner spotted a young boy, about seven, walking along the side of the road holding a fishing rod. He pulled over. Slizzard leaned his sweaty head out the car window. Say, he began, do you by any chance know where Einstein lives? The boy looked up and said, of course. Albert Einstein stood on the porch of his rented cottage, looking cool, tan and relaxed in loose pants and t-shirt and slippers. His famous mane of white hair was windswept from a morning of sailing on Long Island Sound. He welcomed the weary Hungarians, inviting them to sit down and have some iced tea. After a few minutes of small talk, Slizzard and Wigner brought up the subject they'd come to discuss. They told Einstein about the newest discoveries in fission and explained how uranium might be used to build devastating bombs. Einstein had been following the fission research. He took a minute to process the science. Then he said, I hadn't thought of that at all. Einstein quickly realized that with atomic bombs, Adolf Hitler would be absolutely unstoppable. And Einstein was just as horrified as I was by that prospect, Wigner recalled. He volunteered to do whatever he could to prevent it. Wigner got out a pen and a piece of paper. He took notes as Slizzard and Einstein worked out the text of a letter to President Roosevelt. Six weeks later, on September 1, 1939, Germany launched a massive invasion of Poland. Using a new style of attack known as the Blitzkrieg, German for lightning war, Hitler's planes, tanks, and soldiers slashed deep into Polish territory. Britain and France had promised to protect Poland. They had no choice but to declare war on Germany. They did, but it had no effect on the German charge. Hitler's troops poured into Warsaw, Poland's capital, in late September. On October 11th, in Washington, D.C., an economist named Alexander Sachs showed his ID to security guards outside the White House. He walked into the building with Albert Einstein's letter in his briefcase. Sachs was a former aide to President Roosevelt and a personal friend. He also knew Leo Slizzard, and he told Slizzard that he could get Einstein's letter directly into Roosevelt's hands. The start of World War II had made it tough to get an appointment with the president, but he'd finally made it. Sachs was ushered into the Oval Office, where the president was seated behind his desk. Alex, Roosevelt said, flashing his famously big smile. What are you up to? Sachs sat down. He asked Roosevelt to listen very carefully to what he had to say. Roosevelt poured two glasses of brandy, got comfortable in his chair, and motioned for Sachs to begin. Sachs explained the warning in Einstein's letter. The element uranium may be turned into a new and important source of energy in the immediate future, Einstein had written. One day, man will release and control its most infinite power. We cannot prevent him from doing so and can only hope that he will not use it exclusively in blowing up his next-door neighbor. 
Einstein urged the government to work closely with physicists to explore the possibilities of building atomic bombs. The letter ended with one last piece of information. Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from Czechoslovakian mines, which she has taken over. This was a chilling clue. The Germans were grabbing all the uranium they could get. Why? Were they already working on a bomb? Roosevelt thought for a moment. Alex, he began, what you are after is to see that the Nazis don't blow us up. Precisely. Roosevelt nodded. He banged on his desk. He said, this requires action. Trade Craft Within weeks of getting Einstein's letter, President Roosevelt formed the Uranium Committee, a group of military leaders and scientists. Their goal was to figure out the basics of how an atomic bomb might work and what materials would be needed. The project got off to a slow start. Sixteen different teams were spread out around the country. They began with a budget of just $6,000. An alarmed Einstein sent a second letter to President Roosevelt. Since the outbreak of the war, interest in uranium has intensified in Germany, Einstein warned. I have now learned that research there is being carried out in great secrecy. The race to build the atomic bomb was on. Just about the last person anyone would expect to be involved was Harry Gold. When World War II began, Gold was a 28-year-old chemist, living with his parents and younger brother in a working-class Philadelphia neighborhood. He stood five foot six with thick black hair and a soft, round face. Friends described him as shy, smart, and always ready to help anyone who asked. He was the kind of guy who seemed to blend in with the background, who could come and go from a room without being noticed. You'd never in a million years believe this guy was a spy, one neighbor later said. And yet, Harry Gold was about to become a major player in what FBI director J. Edgar Hoover would call the crime of the century. It all began one snowy night in February 1933, in the depths of the Great Depression. Like millions of Americans, Gold had been laid off from his job. His family was way behind on rent and facing eviction from their apartment. One night, after another hopeless job search, Gold was resting at home when a friend came racing through the door. The friend explained that a guy he knew, Tom Black, was leaving his job at a soap factory in Jersey City. Black had arranged to get Gold the job, if Gold was willing to move to New Jersey. Gold's mother leaped up and started stuffing her son's clothes into cardboard suitcases. Gold borrowed a few dollars and hurried to the bus station. Arriving in Jersey City after midnight, he walked down slushy sidewalks to Tom Black's apartment. Black was waiting for me downstairs, Gold remembered. I can still see that huge, friendly, freckled face, the grin, and the feel of the bear-like grip of, it, of his hand. The first thing Black said was, I am a communist, and I am going to make a communist out of you. Gold earned $30 a week at the soap factory and sent $20 home to his parents. He was proud to be supporting his family and didn't mind the hard work. I was grateful to Tom Black, he later said. Very much so. That was exactly what Black was counting on. Black dropped by Gold's rented room often to lecture his new friend about communism and the Soviet Union. Gold only knew the basics— Communists had taken over Russia in a recent revolution and had remained, renamed the country the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or Soviet Union. Black told Gold that the Soviet government had abolished private property and was making all the decisions about what the economy should produce and how goods should be distributed. In this way, Black said, the Soviets would soon wipe out the, agreed, the greed and poverty plaguing countries like the United States. Black pressured Gold to officially join the Communist Party. I just kept stalling, Gold explained. I had no interest in the matter whatsoever. Then came some good news. Gold's former employer, a chemical plant called the Pennsylvania Sugar Company, was hiring again. Gold was offered his old job back. He jumped at the chance to move back to Philadelphia. But Tom Black didn't give up that easily. In early 1934, he came to visit Gold in Philadelphia. Harry! You've been stalling me, Black said. You've been trying to get out of joining the Communist Party. And possibly I don't blame you. This last line got Gold's attention. But there is something you can do, Black continued. There is something that would be very helpful to the Soviet Union, 
and something in which you can take pride. The plant where gold worked, Black explained, used cutting-edge processes to produce many useful chemicals. The people of the Soviet Union need these processes, said Black. If you will obtain as many of them as you can in complete detail and give them to me, I will see to it that these processes are turned over to the Soviet Union. Gold took a long moment before saying, I'll think it over. But actually, he later explained, I had already formed my judgment. Yes, I would. Some spies do it for the money. Others are trying to change the world. Gold's reasons were a lot less dramatic. He was thankful to Black for getting him a job and wanted to repay the debt. Also, Gold had what he described as an almost puppy-like eagerness to please. Here was a chance to do something nice for Black and help the Soviet people. The chemical processes Black wanted didn't seem so secret, and if the information could, be, could really help the Soviets build a better society, why not share it? Who would it hurt? And that, said Gold, is how I began. Gold started sneaking documents out of his lab, plans and formulas for making industrial chemicals. Every few weeks, he'd travel to New York City to meet with a Soviet contact. Gold knew these men only by fake first names. He'd hand over his stash of stolen documents, then hang around a coffee shop while the papers were copied. He got the papers back, rode back to Philadelphia, and returned the documents before anyone noticed they were missing. By the time that World War II began, Gold had given the Soviets every bit of useful information the Pennsylvania Sugar Company had in its files. He was tired of the long trips to New York, the constant lies to his family. Besides, Gold was starting to realize that the Soviet Union was hardly the workers' paradise Tom Black had described. In fact, it was a police state, ruthlessly run by Joseph Stalin, a dictator, who arrested and executed his political rivals, just like Hitler. Equally disturbing to Gold was the news that just days before the war started, Stalin and Hitler had signed a special pact, agreeing not to fight each other. Why would Stalin make a deal with the devil, Gold wondered. He was convinced it was time to leave his secret life behind. The Soviets had different ideas. Gold's Soviet contact, known to Gold only as Fred, told Gold to get a job at a weapons factory, someplace with technology worth stealing, and Fred wanted Gold to start recruiting other spies with technical knowledge. I'm giving you orders, Fred shouted. When Gold hesitated, Fred went further. Should Gold ever get the idea of walking away from the Soviets, Fred, assur Fred assured Gold that his boss would get an anonymous note all about Gold's illegal activities. You'll be finished, Fred shouted. And don't think we will hesitate to do this. Life improved a bit under Gold's next Soviet contact, a man Gold knew as Sam. During long walks along New York City streets, Sam gave Gold a basic education in tradecraft, the art and science of spying. Gold was taught never to use his real name when doing secret work, never to share his address. He learned to sit at booths and restaurants because they kept him more hidden than tables. In the subway, he sat right next to the doors. If he was being tailed, he could wait for a stop, let the doors begin to close, then leap up and jump out as the doors shut behind him. Gold was never to attend to communist meetings, never to read communist papers, never to express even the slightest interest in the Soviet Union. The main rule was this, present the appearance of a normal American. Gold enjoyed these talks and even felt comfortable enough to bring up his concerns about the Soviet Union, including Stalin's treaty with Adolf Hitler. What the hell? Gold asked. Look, you fool, Sam said, laughing. What the Soviet Union needs more than anything in the world is time. Precious time. Stalin had no intention of keeping the agreement, Sam said, but the deal gave the Soviets time to build up their military strength. And when the proper hour comes, you'll see. We'll sweep over Germany and Hitler like nothing ever imagined. While Gold and Sam strolled in New York, Adolf Hitler was on the move in Europe. German forces captured Norway and Denmark in April 1940, then turned against France, the Netherlands, and Belgium, forcing all three to surrender within a month. German bombs pounded British cities night after night. Great Britain stood alone in the war against Hitler. The United States rushed weapons to the British, but stayed out of the fighting. Gold continued bringing Sam documents from his company files, but both knew the stuff was of little value. In early 1941, Gold got some welcome news from Sam. They had decided to drop me entirely. Gold was relieved to have his life back. 
He even began dreaming of starting a family of his own. It was too good to be true. Stalin may have intended to break his treaty with Hitler, but Hitler beat Stalin to the punch. In June 1941, the German dictator launched a four-million-man invasion force across the Soviet border. The German Blitzkrieg drove, dove deeper into Soviet territory, capturing millions of soldiers and quickly approaching the Soviet capital of Moscow. Sam called gold. The Soviets wanted him back. It was not a request. The Soviets had spies inside various factories, Americans who were willing to secretly share information with the Russians in exchange for cash. Gold's new job was to act as a courier. He began taking long bus rides across New York State, picking up files in Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo. He was sent to Tennessee to get a sample of a new kind of explosive. He brought everything back to New York City and delivered it to Sam. Sam's real name was Semyon Semenoyev, a 30-year-old engineer with a degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Semenoyev worked for a Soviet trading company based in New York, but that was just the cover for his real work. Semenoyev was a secret agent for the Soviet intelligence agency, the KGB. After picking up materials from gold, Sam would head for the Soviet consulate, a three-story building in Manhattan. He climbed past the first two floors where the Soviet clerks did normal consulate work, like helping Soviet citizens get travel visas. Then, making sure no one was in the hall, he would take out a key unlock the door for the third floor, and enter the secret New York City headquarters of the KGB. It was a large open room with desks and metal shutters on the windows and a portrait of the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin gazing down. Sebnoev handed his documents to another agent and quickly left the building. The stolen information was translated into secret code and sent by telegram to KGB headquarters in Moscow. Rapid Rupture Simon Semenoyev's engineering job gave him a legitimate reason to be in the United States, but that didn't make him any less suspect in the eyes of the FBI. American agents had no evidence that Semenoyev was a spy, but they knew some Soviets living in the United States were spies. They figured Semenoyev might be one of them. They followed him on the street, into restaurants, onto the subway. Semenoyev and a KGB colleague named Alexander Fekliskov uh, began working together to try to shake the FBI. We often tailed each other on our way to secret meetings, we called Fek Lizov, uh, to make sure we were not being followed. If they weren't sure whether they were being watched, they had several strategies ready. It was a good test to enter a bar or a store, explained Fek Lizov, because one of the agents had to run inside to make sure no rendezvous was in progress. You could also hop on a bus, which would force the FBI agent to tip his hand by getting on also. Years later, Feklazov was asked whether he and Semenoyev felt guilty about stealing technology from the Americans. After all, soon after Germany attacked the Soviet Union, the United States began shipping planes, tanks, cannons, and food to the desperate Soviets. But Feklazov and Semenoyev held the view that was common among Russians at the time. Yes, the United States was helping the Soviet Union, but not out of the kindness of its heart. The United States and Soviet Union had never been friendly, and nothing had really changed. America's help to the Soviets was the product of cold logic. The Soviet Union was battling Germany. America badly wanted to see Germany beaten. So, Americans were glad to have the Soviets do the bloody work of fighting Hitler. When you know you're being taken advantage of, Feklazov said, you have every right to be clever. Meanwhile, the FBI was watching Americans too. One night, early in the war, Robert Oppenheimer drove to the home of a friend and fellow Berkeley professor, Hakon Chevalier. Oppenheimer parked in the street and walked to Chevalier's front door. Watching from down the block were the two, two agents from the FBI. The agents knew that Chevalier was a member of the Communist Party. They knew he hosted political discussion groups. It wasn't illegal to be a communist, but it seemed likely that American communists might feel allegiance to the Soviet Union. Could a citizen be a communist and a loyal American at the same time? The FBI thought not. So, agents watched known communists like Chevalier paying special attention to their friends and associates. In 1941, the FBI opened a file on Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer continued to teach physics, but he felt restless, like he should be doing something to help stop Hitler. Many of the men I had known went off to work at, on radar and other aspects of military research, he later said. I was not without envy of them. The war news got worse and worse. 
Germany formed an alliance with Japan, which had a powerful military of its own and dreams of building an empire in Asia. While Hitler's forces overran Europe, Japan was on the attack in China and Southeast Asia. The United States cut off oil exports to Japan. This left Japan, a nation with few natural resources, with barely enough fuel to survive another year. President Roosevelt hoped Japanese leaders would be convinced to stop their armies from advancing further. Instead, Japan became even more determined to conquer new territory, new sources of raw materials, even if this meant taking on the United States. With so many crises competing for Roosevelt's attention, the Uranium Committee continued to just crawl along. Frustrated by the slow pace of progress, physicist and U Committee member Ernest Lawrence urged the committee to bring in some fresh talent. He suggested starting with a colleague of his at Berkeley, Robert Oppenheimer. In October 1941, Oppenheimer attended his first meeting of the Uranium Committee. The members discussed the largest man-made explosion in history to that point in 1917 in Halifax Harbor, Canada. A ship packed with millions of pounds of bombs and ammunition caught fire and blew up. The blast flattened buildings a mile in all directions and killed at least 2,000 people. It sent one, a 1,000-pound anchor soaring two miles through the air. One uranium bomb, small enough to fit in a plane, could pack about 10 times that power. The meeting changed Oppenheimer's life. From that moment, he knew he'd found his role in what was becoming a global showdown. I spent some time in preliminary calculations about the construction and performance of atomic bombs, he said, and became increasingly excited about the prospects. Two months later, at the U.S. military base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, an army sergeant named Joseph P Pisek went to, woke up early. It was December 7th, a Sunday. Pisek was looking forward to a few hours of leave. After breakfast, I headed for the bus stop to wait for the 805 bus to take me to Honolulu where I was to play golf, he said. While sitting there on the beach, I noticed a large flight of aircraft approaching from the northwest. As the planes neared land, PSEC saw them start a sudden dive toward the harbor, where most of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet was docked. Some kind of training exercise, he figured. Standing on the deck of the battleship USS Arizona, a sailor named George Frainer had the same thought. First, he heard the buzz of airplane engines. Then, he saw the planes drop out of the clouds. It didn't mean anything to us, he remembered, until a large group of planes came near the ship, and we could see them for the first time, the rising sun emblem on the plane wings. This red sun was the symbol of Japan. The Japanese were attacking Pearl Harbor. Bombs began smashing the water, smashing into ships, blasting planes parked on the ground, igniting fires everywhere. Air raid! Air raid! shouted a voice over the ship's loudspeakers. This is a real attack! Real planes! Real bombs! Frayner dashed below to get ammunition for his crew gun. Gun crew. He was lifting a 90-pound case when he heard a deafening roar and felt the entire ship rock violently. The lights went out, the cabin filled with smoke. The metal walls were heating up as Frayner felt his way to the ladder leading up to the deck. He started climbing. I was nauseated by the smell of burning flesh, which turned out to be my own as I climbed up the hot ladder, he said. A quick glance around revealed nothing in the darkness but moaning and sounds of falling bodies. When he finally tumbled in onto the deck, Frayner saw the broken bodies and boat body parts and pooling blood and flames everywhere. The ship was going down fast. He leaped over the side and struggled toward shore, splashing through water covered with blotches of burning black oil. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor destroyed or damaged 18 warships and nearly 350 planes. More than 1,100 crew members went down with the Arizona. A total of 2,390 American soldiers and sailors were killed. You gave the right declaration of war, Adolf Hitler raved to the Japanese ambassador in Berlin. This method is the only proper one. Roosevelt was having lunch in the White House when he got the news. They caught our ships like lame ducks, Roosevelt shouted, pounding on his desk. They caught our planes on the ground, by God, on the ground! As radio and newspapers spread the story, the mood in America shifted quickly from shock to fury to vows of revenge. Roosevelt asked Congress for an immediate declaration of war on Japan, and he got it. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, Roosevelt declared, 
the American people, in their righteous might, will win through to absolute victory. Hitler responded by declaring war on the United States. The sides were set for the biggest and deadliest war in history. The United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union led the Allied powers against the Axis powers of Germany, Japan, and Italy. At stake, the future of the world. Pearl Harbor was a turning point for Robert Oppenheimer, too. From that moment on, he decided to forget about politics and discussion groups. He decided to pour all his energy into beating Hitler in the race for the atomic bomb. Just a few weeks after Pearl Harbor, I received a phone call from Oppie. He called a young physicist named Robert Serber. He said he was in Chicago and wanted to come down and talk with me about something. A former student of Oppenheimer's, Serber was teaching at the University of Illinois in Ar- Urbana. He had no idea why Oppenheimer would want to see him. Oppenheimer drove to the campus and found Serber. They walked out of town and into the cornfields. When they were alone in the fields, Oppenheimer explained his work with the Uranium Committee. He told Serber he was about to be placed in charge of fast neuron research, the study of speeding neurons in fission. His ominous official title would be Coordinator of Rapid Rupture. He wanted Serber in Berkeley, Berkeley as his assistant. Serber and his wife packed up their car, drove west, and moved into the apartment above Oppenheimer's garage. At Oppenheimer's office on the Berkeley campus, they began designing the atomic bomb. The work was thrilling and frightening. There was no way to know what German scientists were up to or how far ahead they might already be. Oppenheimer knew that this was a duel the United States could not afford to lose. We were aware, he said of the Germans, of what it might mean if they beat us to the draw. Norway Connection Luckily for Oppenheimer, he was not in the fight alone. One of his most valuable allies would be a man he didn't know and would never meet, a 29-year-old Norwegian named Knut Hoeklid. Hoeklid had dark wavy hair and a broad muscular body toughened by years of hiking and skiing. When the Germans conquered Norway in 1940, Hoeklid and a few friends had refused to admit defeat. They strapped guns to their backs and skied deep into the roadless forests and mountains. There was only one thought in our heads, he later said. Hitler and his gang should be thrown back into the sea. While crossing a lake on a ferry boat, they found an outlet for their rage. Standing on deck, leaning casually on the rail, was a Norwegian man in a Nazi uniform. Some Norwegians were Nazi sympathizers who aided the invading army. After waiting until the boat was about 300 yards from shore, Hockelid gestured for his friends to follow. He walked up to the Nazi. Heil Hitler, Hockelid said, using the typical Nazi greeting. Heil Hitler, the man said, reaching out to shake hands. As Hockelid grasped the man's hand, his friends grabbed the Nazi, lifted him over the rail, and dropped him into the lake. The only thing that floated was his hat. Over the following year, Newt Haukelid found a more organized and effective way to fight Germans. He joined one of the secret resistance groups that were forming all over Norway. He began working as a radio operator and spy. No one, not even those nearest to us, could know what was going on, he said. Anyone caught resisting the German occupation was instantly shot. In the daytime, we had to do our extraordinary work, he explained. We were dropping with fatigue. What kept us going was a growing pride in doing something, little as it was, against the hated invaders. By day, Hockel had worked at a German-controlled submarine base. After dark, he gathered his radio equipment, snuck out of town on a bicycle, and searched for a remote electrical pole. He climbed the wooden pole, tapped into the electrical wires, powered up his radio, and sent information on German military movements to British intelligence officers in London. We had many wild plans in those days, Hockelid remembered. Hoping to deal the Nazis a more direct blow, he and his friends concocted a plot to kidnap Vidkun Quisling, leader of the Norwegian Nazis. The plan was to knock Quisling unconscious, drive him into the mountains, call Britain for a plane, fly him to London, and put him on display in a cage. Hockel had found out where Quisling was staying in Oslo. He rented a room across the hall, contacted a fellow resistance fighter who worked for the telephone company, and arranged to listen in on Quisling's phone line. The plan was to find out where he, when he ordered a car, Hockel had said, so that we could pick him up in one of ours. Hockel had's men dressed in stolen Nazi uniforms, so Quisling wouldn't be suspicious until it was too late. 
But before they could pull the trigger on the operation, German intelligence uncovered Hauklid's crew of radio operators. Some of the men were thrown into concentration camps. Hauklid escaped into the mountains. He managed to get across the border to Sweden by bicycle and traveled from there by plane to Great Britain. Hauklid was safe, but all I could think about was getting back home to continue the fight. He would get his wish, and more. What Hauklid did not yet know was that a remote factory perched on the side of a cliff in Norway was the key to Germany's top-secret atomic bomb project. Someone had to put that factory out of operation, and he was about to get the job. Back in Norway, Hitler's secret police force, the Gestapo, got Hauklid's name and stormed his family's house. They ransacked the place for evidence of his undercover work. A Gestapo officer cornered his mother, demanding information. She wouldn't talk. A furious S.W. Femer, chief of Gestapo intelligence in Norway, stepped forward and ordered her to tell him where Hauklid had gone. He is in the mountains, she responded. No, shouted Femer. He is in Britain. Our contact in Sweden tells us that he has been taken across the North Sea in a fighter plane. And what do you think he is doing there? Hauklid's mother had no idea, but she knew her son. She suspected it would be something big. Staring Femur straight in the eyes, she said, You will find out when he comes back. In Ormos Early in 1942, a young Soviet physicist named George Flerov sat in the library of a military base in southwestern Russia, flipping through a tall stack of physics journals from the United States. When the Germans invaded, Flerov had put his studies aside to serve in the Soviet Air Force, but he couldn't stop thinking about fission. So when he had a free moment, he snuck off to the library to read the rest of the newest discoveries. I hope to look through the latest papers on the fission of uranium, he said. Up until that point, American physics magazines had been filled with articles on new experiments and theories about fission. Suddenly, there was nothing. This silence is not the result of an absence of research, Flaroff warned his government. In a word, the seal of silence has been imposed, and this is the best proof of the vigorous work that is going on now abroad. Flaroff guessed right. The work, was being, the work being done by Oppenheimer and others on the Uranium Committee was top secret. The Soviet Union and the United States were allies in World War II, but that's because they were fighting common enemies, not because they liked each other. Even more distressing to Flaroff was the idea of a German atomic bomb. Germany had first-class scientists, he said, and significant supplies of uranium core ore. If Hitler got his hands on atomic bombs, that would be the end of the Soviet Union. To Soviet physicists like Flaroff, this made it virtually vitally important that the Soviet Union develop its own atomic bomb. But the war was making this impossible. Russian forces stopped the German advance just short of Moscow, but the two massive armies were still slugging it out along a battlefront stretching 1,500 miles from north to south. Soviet scientists had to abandon fission experiments to work instead on weapons that could be used right away. The message to Soviet leaders was clear. If the Soviets were going to get an atomic bomb any time in the near future, they were going to have to steal it. This was a job for the KGB. In March 1942, Semen Semenoyev and his fellow KGB agents in New York got a coded telegram from Moscow headquarters explaining the task. Germany and the USA are frantically working to obtain uranium, Moscow warned, and use it as an explosive to make bombs of enormous destructive power, and to all appearances, this problem is quite close to practical solution. It is essential that we take up this problem in all seriousness. Soviet spies in American cities began working on what they called agent cultivation. In tradecraft, cultivation means gathering information on a potential source, feeling him out to see if he might be convinced to cooperate. This was a tough task, since Soviet agents didn't know which American scientists were working on the atomic bomb. Suddenly, in late March, the KGB got a break. One night, on a New York City subway, a KGB courier named Zalmond Franklin ran into an old friend, Clarence Hiskry. Hiskri was a chemist and a professor at Columbia University. The two had gone to college together in the 1930s. Both had been sympathetic to the Soviet Union and members of the Communist Party. The friends went to dinner and talked over old times. He decided to walk me to the subway, Franklin reported to his KGB contact. 
Our conversation on the way is what leads to the reason for this report. As they strolled, Hiskey shocked Franklin by saying, Imagine a bomb dropped in the center of this city, which would destroy the entire city. Franklin laughed. There is such a bomb, Hiskey blurted out. I'm working on it. Trying to appear only casually interested, Franklin asked for a few more details. Hiskey explained that he and other scientists were working with desperate haste to build an atomic bomb. It would be the most powerful weapon ever produced. The Germans, he added, were probably far ahead on the bomb. Then, after this burst of top-secret information, Hiskey went silent. Hiskey was sorry he told me about this, Franklin reported, and swore me to silence. Vasily Zerubin, the top KGB agent in New York City, telegraphed Franklin's report to headquarters in Moscow. Moscow responded quickly, telling Zerubin the information is of great interest to us and attaching a long list of technical questions about fission and bomb-making. Zerubin gave the list to Franklin, ordering Franklin to get answers from his friend. Franklin went to Hiskey's apartment but faced a major obstacle. Hiskey's wife was there. Franklin was under strict KGB orders not to discuss the subject of atomic bombs in front of anyone but Hiskey. The three sat down at dinner. At no time did Clarence bring up the subject of his work, Franklin reported, and following instructions, I did not mention the subject. After the meal, Franklin tried to get Hiskey alone with no success. His wife was present the entire evening, explained Franklin. This, that proved to be Franklin's one and only chance. Hiskey was soon transferred to the University of Chicago. When a Soviet agent in Chicago made contact with Hiskey, the meetings were observed by FBI agents. The FBI informed the U.S. Army that Hiskey had been spotted with a suspected Soviet agent. Hiskey suddenly found himself drafted into the Army and shipped to a remote military base in the Northwest Territories of Canada, far from atomic bomb secrets. Hiskey was never given an explanation. He knew better than to ask for one. Hiskey's story illustrates just how hard it was for Soviet spies to get at American secrets. It was difficult because we always felt we were under FBI surveillance, said KGB agent Alexander Fiskalov. From the moment I arrived in New York, I was always sh shadowed as soon as I stepped outside. Still, the Soviets were absolutely determined to steal the bomb. It was such a top high priority, they codenamed the project Enormaz, Russian for enormous. But Enormaz would go nowhere until the KGB got a reliable source inside the American bomb project. With this goal in mind, Moscow headquarters made up a list of top American scientists to target for cultivation. One of the leads we have, Moscow informed its agents in the United States, we should consider it essential to cultivate the following people. Then came the names. The people on the list were all top scientists the Soviets suspected might be in on the bomb work. They were all known to have been sympathetic to communism before the war. The first name on the list was Robert Oppenheimer. On the Cliff On the morning of June 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt sat in the driver's seat of his Ford convertible parked beside an airstrip in Hyde Park, New York. He watched a small U.S. Army plane descend toward the runway. The plane hit the ground hard, bounced several times, and rattled to a stop. The plane door opened, and out hopped Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain, a fat cigar in his hand. Roosevelt smiled and waved. Churchill walked over to the car and got in the passenger seat. The two leaders shook hands warmly. Then Roosevelt gunned his car engine and sped off. He took me to the majestic bluffs over the Hudson River on which Hyde Park, his family home, stands, Churchill remembered. But as the car raced along the edge of the cliff, the Prime Minister had a tough time keeping his mind on the gorgeous view. He kept glancing over at the American, wondering how exactly the man was controlling the vehicle. Roosevelt had had polio as a young man and had lost the use of his legs. Roosevelt saw the worry on his friend's face. He explained that he'd had this car specially rigged, allowing him to work the gas, clutch, and brakes with his hands, while also steering, of course. Churchill was impressed, but still terrified. Smiling, Roosevelt assured Churchill his arms were more than strong enough to do the job. He invited me to feel his biceps, Churchill recalled, saying that a famous prize fighter had envied them. This was reassuring. As Roosevelt drove, the two men began talking over the state of the war. And though I was careful not to take his attention off the driving, Churchill said, we made more progress than we might have done in a formal conference. 
Later that day, the conversation continued in a small office inside Roosevelt's family mansion. They, uh, they focused on the subject Churchill called overwhelmingly the most important, the race to build an atomic bomb. Britain and American scientists were both exploring the science. Both had come to the conclusion that a fission bomb was technically possible. I strongly urge that we should at once pool all our information, work together on equal terms, and share the results, if any, equally between us, Churchill said of the meeting. Roosevelt agreed. The project would be enormously expensive, they knew, and it would mean pulling top scientists off other high-priority weapons projects. It was worth the risk, they decided. If Britain still un With Britain still under attack from German bombers, they agreed the actual work of building a bomb would be done in America. There had been a lot of talk so far, and some research. Now it was time for action. We both felt painfully the dangers of doing nothing, Churchill recalled. What if the, ener what if the enemy should get an atomic bomb before we did? Three months later, a six-foot, 250-pound army colonel named Leslie Groves was walking down the hallway of a congressional office building on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Groves had one thing on his mind, getting out of Washington. I was, he later said, like every other regular officer, extremely eager for service abroad as a commander of combat troops. When he saw General Brahan Somerville walking toward him, Graves stopped. The men were alone in the hall. The Secretary of War has selected you for a very important assignment, Somerville told Groves. The President has approved the selection. Where? asked Groves. Washington. I don't want to stay in Washington. If you do the job right, it will win the war. Graves felt his heart sink. He'd heard rumors about a project to build some kind of super bomb. He was not impressed. Oh, he sighed, that thing. You can do it, Somerville assured him. If it can be done. 46-year-old Leslie Groves was an engineer by training. He just finished managing the construction of the Pentagon, the biggest office building in the world. Groves brought the job in on time and on budget. As a reward, he was put in charge of the atomic bomb project. My initial reaction was one of extreme disappointment, he confessed. Groves was a big man with a big personality, loud, bossy, demanding, quick to criticize. He had no hesitation in letting others know of his high opinion of himself, said one former staff member. Another put it simply, Groves is the biggest SOB I have ever worked for. And yet, everyone agreed that to lead a huge project involving the juggling of dozens of complex tasks, Groves was the right choice. If I can't do the job, said Groves, no one man can. In meetings over the next few days, Groves was given the complete picture. Roosevelt wanted the U.S. Army to take over the atomic bomb project, codenamed the Manhattan Project, because its first offices were located in Manhattan. It was Groves' job to make sure the bomb got built quickly and in complete secrecy. Groves was promoted to general and took command of the Manhattan Project on September 18, 1942. I was not happy with the information, Groves grumbled about when he first learned so far. In fact, I was horrified. It seemed as if the whole endeavor was founded on possibilities rather than probabilities. Of theory, there was a great deal of, much pr of proven knowledge, not much. When Groves met with uranium committee members in Chicago, they told him it would take somewhere between 10 and 1,000 pounds of uranium to make an atomic bomb. The wide range infuriated Groves. It would be like trying to plan a wedding, he shouted, and telling the caterer, we don't know how many guests are coming, maybe somewhere between 10 and 1,000, but see to it that you have the right amount of food for them. Groves knew he could handle planning and logistics. The problem was he was going to have to rely on physicists to figure out how to build the bomb. Groves needed to quickly gather a team of the best scientists in the country, and he needed to pick someone to lead it. Robert Oppenheimer wanted the job. Oppenheimer first met Groves on October 8th on the Berkeley campus. Groves was traveling around the country, meeting people who'd been taught working on the Uranium Committee. He and Oppenheimer chatted at lunch, then Oppenheimer invited Groves back to his office for a longer talk. Oppenheimer laid out his vision for getting the bomb built. Work was being done at universities all over the country, he told Groves. Scientists were wasting time doing the same things on different campuses, and because of security worries, they weren't allowed to share information over the phone or by mail. That had to end. A major change was called for in the work on the bomb itself, Oppenheimer later explained. We needed a central laboratory devoted wholly to this purpose, where people could talk freely with each other. Groves was impressed. 
He's a genius, a real genius, Groves told a reporter years later. Why, Oppenheimer knows about everything. He can talk to you about anything you bring up. Well, not exactly. I guess there are a few things he doesn't know about. He doesn't know anything about sports. Groves also liked the fact that Oppenheimer had been born in the United States. Most, were, most of the top physicists in the country were from Europe. That made it nearly impossible to carefully check their backgrounds to make sure they could be trusted with American secrets. But Oppenheimer presented problems, too. No one with whom I showed... No one with whom I talked showed any great enthusiasm about Oppenheimer as a pro possible director of the projects, Groves lamented. First of all, he was a famously absent-minded scientist, leaving in an abs living in an abstract world of ideas and numbers. Could he really be a disciplined, focused team leader? Probably not, said most who knew him. He had, after all, no experience in directing a large group of people, said the German-born physicist Hans Baith. A Berkeley College colleague put it more bluntly. He couldn't run a hamburger stand. Groves had a gut feeling Oppenheimer could rise to the challenge. The more he thought about it and the more potential candidates he met, the more convinced he became that he wanted Oppenheimer. But there was a bigger problem. Oppenheimer couldn't work on the Manhattan Project until he got security clearance from the Army. Thanks to a report from the FBI, Army intelligence officers knew all about Oppenheimer's past association with the communists. Oppenheimer shouldn't be allowed anywhere near the most dangerous secret in the world, argued the FBI, because he might leak the information to his communist friends and from there to the Soviet Union. Oppenheimer insisted he was a loyal American. He swore he'd never actually joined the Communist Party and that, in any case, his interest in communism was a thing of the past. Groves believed him. FBI agents and Army intelligence officers did not. Groves made the call. It is desired that clearance be issued for the employment of Robert Oppenheimer without delay, ordered Groves. He is absolutely essential to the project. Oppenheimer was given an army physical and failed. Nearly six feet tall, he weighed just 128 pounds. His chain smoking gave him a chronic cough, causing army doctors to declare him permanently incapacitated for active service. Again, Groves pulled rank. He ordered the doctors to make Oppenheimer eligible for active duty. Oppenheimer wasn't fit to be a soldier, Groves acknowledged, but he just might be able to win the war. International Gangster School When Newt Hockelid stepped off the train in London, he was met immediately by two British officers. They knew Hockelid had been battling the Germans in Norway and had barely gotten out alive. They had special orders for him. Alcala had climbed into a car with the British officers and they drove through a city battered by German bombs. Ruined houses and bombed blocks of flats made gaps in the vista, remembered Halkalid. One area in the heart of the city was just a desert of ruins. Only the street remained, running empty and purposeless between heaps of fallen masonry. Halkalid was taken to meet with an officer of the Special Operations Executive. The SOE was a secret British organization tasked with carrying out acts of sabotage behind enemy lines all over Europe. The SOE officer suggested that perhaps Haukelid would be interested in returning to Norway on a secret mission. Can I have more instruction in the use of weapons? Haukelid asked. Yes, said the officer. There's a section which is just the thing for you. Haukelid just uh, was sent to a remote spot in the south of England and enrolled in special training school number three. The Germans who'd heard rumors about the place called it International Gangster School. From a purely practical standpoint, Halklid conceded, they were undoubtedly right. Here, I found nearly 30 Norwegian boys from all parts of the country, Halklid said of the special training school number three. The men all had one goal in mind, to get back home and liberate their country from the Germans. This is the only friend you can rely on, said their instructor, holding up a pistol. Treat him properly, and he'll take care of you. The men were taught to pick locks, crack safes, set booby traps, and use poison. They were taught to kill with their hands and feet. Never give a man the chance, the instructor told them. If you've got him down, kick him to death. Hauklid and the class were transferred to Scotland, where they began parachute school. To get back into Norway, they'd have to be dropped by plane in the dark. They practiced by jumping out of hot air balloons at night. It was not at all like jumping from a plane, explained Klaus Helberg, one of Haukelid's fellow students. It takes about five seconds for the chute to open, and since you can't see how close you are to the earth, you keep wondering, will I hit before it opens? Everything is quiet. It's dark. And as you fall, you get this 
terrifying sense of the increasing velocity of your descent from the sound of the air rushing through your clothing. When the parachutes finally opened, the men floated toward the ground, still unable to see anything around them, but they could hear the instructors below, joking about which of the poor bastards would be the first to break his legs. The SOE picked five of the best men for a special mission. Halklid was part of the team until an accident put him out of action. During a field exercise, he remembered, I stumbled with a loaded pistol in my hand and put a bullet through the sole of my foot. Halklid lay in the hospital, cursing his stupid mistake. The other four men were taken to London to prepare for the job. Only Jens Powelson, the leader of this small Norwegian team, was given a full briefing. At SOE offices in London, the 24-year-old Powelson puffed on his pipe while a British colonel named John Wilson announced the target of the secret mission, the Ver Vermork Power Plant, built into the side of a mountain near the town of Rujikon, Norway. Powelson tapped ashes from his pipe into the palm of his hand. Interesting, he said. Rajukin was Paulson's hometown. He'd spent his childhood climbing and skiing near the, in the nearby mountains. Vermark was a vital target, Wilson explained, because it was the only plant in the world capable of producing large quantities of heavy water. He gave Paulson the basic chemistry. A molecule of water is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. A normal hydrogen atom has a nucleus with just one proton and no neutrons but some hydrogen atoms have one proton and one neutron. The neutron makes the hydrogen atom heavier. When these heavier hydrogen atoms join with oxygen to form water, the result is heavy water. It's about 10% heavier than regular water. Heavy water occurs naturally in very small quantities, and it's perfectly harmless. Except for one thing. It was a key ingredient in the German atomic bomb program. Wilson didn't explain to Paulson why... German physicists needed heavy water. All Paulson needed to know was that the Germans had rapidly increased production of heavy water at Vermark since taking over Norway. This had to be stopped. The Germans could destroy all of London if they succeeded, Wilson said. I didn't really believe him, Paulson later admitted. In those days, no one thought in terms of one bomb destroying a whole city. But the young Norwegian had his orders. The plan was for Paulson's team to parachute onto Norway's Hardnau Plateau, a 3,500-square-mile wilderness of mountains, marshes, and lakes. On the plateau, the team would set up camp, scout routes to the target, radio weather reports back to Britain, and light up a land landing strip on the edge of a frozen lake. When everything was ready, 34 British commandos would fly in on gliders, land, and set out for the plant. The Norwegians would lead the way and do everything possible to help the British shoulders demolish key parts of Vermork. The SOE gave Paulson's team cash, and the men went from store to store in London buying winter clothing, warm sleeping bags, tents, and compasses. Unable to find Norwegian-made skis and boots, they special ordered them from Iceland. On a clear cold night in late October 1942, the men climbed into a British bomber. The plane went over the North Sea to Norway, when the pilot reached the Hardanger Plateau, the Norwegians heard the engine slowing as the plane's altitude dropped quickly from 10,000 to 1,000 feet. In the bright moonlight, Paulsen and his men could just make out the shapes of dark rocks sticking up from the snowy ground. Action stations! the British dispatcher shouted. The Norwegians lined up near the hatch in the bottom of the plane. They'd been taught to jump in quick succession. No more than one second between men any longer than that, and they'd land too far apart to find each other in the dark. Paulson sat over a hole, his legs dangling in the icy air. The dispatcher shouted, Number one! Go! Gliders down. Paulson jumped, followed quickly by Newt Haugland, Arne Kralstrup, and Klaus Helberg. The wind tore and pulled at me as I fell, remembered Helberg. Suddenly the parachute filled with air and stiffened. There was a violent jerk as it opened wide above me. In the sky around him, Helberg could see the other men, along with the supply crates the British crew had tossed out of the plane behind them. I found myself floating slowly down toward the ground, Helberg recalled. With all our equipment, twelve huge containers floating down through the moonlight behind us and the plane disappearing westwards. Helberg hit the ground hard, but safely. He sank in the steep snow thinking, and we, and here we are in Norway, cold and inhospitable, but marvelous all the same. The men gathered and unrolled their sleeping bags. At sunrise, they began looking for the supply crates. For now, nothing more could be done. 
Palson took out his pipe and filled it with tobacco. It's time I told you the truth, he said. He lit a match and looked at the men. To prevent word of the secret mission from leaking out, he explained, they had been told they were coming to Norway to train other resistance fighters. That was just a cover story, Paulson now confirmed, informed them, touching the match flame to his pipe. We're here on a far more vital assignment, to help destroy the heavy water factory at Vermork. He gave them the details and told them about the British commandos who'd been coming in by plane. The operation would take place during the next full moon. We have four weeks to reconnoiter the plant, get information on the German guards, and check on the landing site. None of the team members made any objection to what, for them, was a radical change of plans. Good night, Paulson said. In the morning, the men took out their maps and compasses, checked nearby landmarks, and realized the British plane had badly missed the intended drop target. They were at least 65 mountainous miles from the glider landing site. All expert skiers, they weren't worried about the distance, but they would be carrying more than 600 pounds of weapons and supplies, and they could expect no help along the way. We've been told to make no outside contacts except in the gravest emergency, Dawson said. It was important that we avoid being seen by anyone. The 12 equipment crates were scattered in the deep snow, and it took the men two days to find them. They divided the stuff into eight loads of about 70 pounds each, figuring it would be foolish to try to carry more over the rough terrain ahead. Finally, they put on their ski boots and skis and set off. Progress was slow, since they each had to handle two 70-pound loads. They would ski a set distance with one load, put it down, return to the starting point, pick up the second load, and make the trip again. Making things worse, it had been a relatively mild autumn in the Hardanger Plateau. The snow was wet and sticky, the ice on the lakes still thin, forcing them to take the long way around the water. The men reminded each other of an old Norwegian saying, A man who is a man goes until he can go no further, and then goes twice as far. The team had enough food for 30 days, but they were burning calories so quickly, they were constantly ravenous. What saved them was that, along the way, they found several summer cabins abandoned for the winter. Inside, they scrounged a few cans of food, a few handfuls of flour. In one cabin they found, sitting on the table, a frozen lump of unidentified meat. They chopped it up with an axe, dropped the pieces into a pot with snow, and set the pot over the fire. We ate our fill for the first time since our arrival, Paulson said. On November 9th, after three grueling weeks on the plateau, Palson and the team finally reached their assigned base near the glider landing site. The men found a thin-walled cabin nearby, stumbled inside, built a fire, and felt lucky to find some food. We made fish soup, Palson said. Good soup, too, out of, a do- out of dog's food. The next step was to contact London. With wind whipping snow crystals into his face, Newt Haugland set up his radio antenna on the roof of the cabin, He climbed down, slammed the door behind him, dove into a sleeping bag on the floor, and pulled the radio close. As snow blew through the cracks in the wall, Haugland tapped out a coded message. The team was intact and healthy and would now begin scouting the target area and preparing the landing site. The message was received in London, but it didn't sound right. Telegraph messages were sent using Morse code in which each letter of the alphabet is represented by a certain combination of long and short sounds. Every telegraph operator has what's known as an operator's fingerprint. Each person taps out the sounds slightly differently. British intelligence had Haugland's fingerprints on file. This new message was not a match. What they didn't take into account was that Haugland's fingers were frozen stiff when he had sent the most recent message. Concerned they might actually be in contact with German agents, the British sent Haugland a prearranged security question, something only he could answer. What did you see walking down the strand in the early hours of January 1st, 1941? Haugland's blue fingers tapped back three pink elephants. Paulson's team was all right, the British knew. The plan could proceed. On a drizzly afternoon ten days later, 34 British commandos gathered on an airfield in Scotland. They divided into groups of 17, and each group climbed into a glider. These were super light wooden planes, specially made for written for Britain's Royal Air Force. They had no engines, which meant they could fly silently, perfect for making an unnoticed approach into enemy territory. Of course, the gliders couldn't take off by themselves. Each was attached by a rope to a Halifax bomber. The bombers took off, towing the gliders behind them. 
the planes headed east across the water as the sun set. On the ground in Norway, Paulsen and his team found the best possible landing spot and set up lights along a strip of land. It was overcast, Paulsen said, but the moon was full. At 11 p.m., the Norwegians heard the hum of engines and the thick clouds above, but they couldn't see the planes, and the pilots couldn't see the landing lights. As one of the bomber pilots was turning around to make another run over the target area, the rope pulling the glider snapped. The glider pilot felt his plane descending. He couldn't see even a few feet in any direction, and with no engines, he had no way of keeping the plane in the air for long. The glider slammed into a snowy hillside. Eight men were killed instantly. Of the survivors, four had broken bones, the other five just minor injuries. Two of the men who were able to walk made it to a nearby farmhouse and convinced the owner to call a doctor. The doctor agreed to come, but, before leaving, alerted the Gestapo of the crash. The Germans arrived to search the plane and crash site. They found weapons, snowshoes, Norwegian currency, radio transmitters, and a map with Vermork circled in blue ink. The Germans loaded the four badly injured men into a truck. By the accepted rules of war, the British soldiers should have been treated as prisoners of war. Instead, the Germans poisoned them and dropped their bodies into the sea. The other five were taken to concentration camps and interrogated by the Gestapo. They refused to give more than their name, rank, and service number. German soldiers blindfolded and handcuffed the prisoners and shot them in the head. The second glider story was similar. It lost its way in the fog and crash-landed, killing several of the crew. The Germans quickly found the wreck, questioned the survivors, then shot them and dumped them in a ditch. The next night, Powell's and team got news from London. The glider disaster was a hard blow, he later said. It was sad and bitter. Thirty-four British soldiers were dead, and nothing had been accomplished. Worse than nothing, because now the Germans knew that the Allies considered Vormork a high-priority target, British intelligence soon learned that German commanders had assigned extra soldiers to guard Vermork, day and night. They had begun placing landmines around the plant. Meanwhile, the plant continued pumping out heavy water, which was piped into barrels and shipped to Germany. This had to be stopped, no matter the risks. Colonel Wilson contacted the Norwegian volunteers who were still training in Scotland. He told them, stand by for a particularly dangerous enterprise. Quiet Fellow one afternoon in late 1942, a dark-haired woman in her mid-thirties rode a bicycle along a country lane near the English town of Banbury. She pulled to the side of the path, got off the bicycle, and leaned it against a tree. She had not been waiting long when she saw a tall man in a suit approaching. He was about 30, pale and thin, with glasses. The man and woman exchanged a few words and began walking arm in arm down the lane. It was pleasant just to have a conversation with so sensitive and intelligent a comrade and scientist, the woman later said. We spoke of books, films, and current affairs. To any viewer, they looked like close friends out for a little stroll. Actually, it was the first time they'd ever met. After about half an hour, the, woman handed, the man handed the woman an envelope. She climbed back on her bicycle and pedaled toward her small college in the nearby town of Oxford, where she was known as Mrs. Brewer a refugee from Germany and mother of two. In fact, her name was Ruth Werner, and she was a spy for the KGB. A German-born communist trained in tradescraft in Moscow, Werner had spent the 1930s working as a Soviet secret agent in China and Switzerland. She'd been sent to Britain in 1941, charged with setting up a network of informants and using, sending useful intelligence to the Soviet Union. It was illegal in wartime Britain for private citizens to use radio transmitters, so Werner smuggled in transmitter parts by hiding them in her children's stuffed animals and assembled the machine at home. She asked her landlord if she could put an antenna on the roof. It looked just like a regular radio antenna. The landlord had no objection. With this setup, she was able to communicate by radio with her KGB bosses in Moscow. Moscow was particularly interested in reports from Werner's new contact, the thin man with glasses and with good reason. He was helping British scientists figure out how to build an atomic bomb. The man was a German-born physicist named Klaus Fuchs. The spelling, a fellow German said of Fuchs's name, sometimes caused people to pronounce it in a somewhat embarrassing way. The solution for English speakers, pronounce it to rhyme with books. As a college student in Germany, Fuchs had watched the rise of Nazis with disgust. 
he joined the Communist Party, impressed by the party's willingness to speak out against Hitler. When Hitler took power in Germany in 1933, Nazi thugs beat Fuchs nearly to death and tossed him in a river. That only strengthened Fuchs's commitment to communism. Fuchs escaped to England, where he learned it earned his PhD in physics. When the war began, British scientists recruited him to help with a secret war-related project, the atomic bomb. I accepted, recalled Fuchs, and I started work without knowing at first what the work was. A gifted physicist, Fuchs was well-liked by his fellow scientists, though they found him difficult to get to know. He was always inside, hunched over his desk. He spoke very little, and never about politics. A very nice, very quiet, with sad eyes, commented one. He seemed like a chap who's never breathed any fresh air, said another. The British knew he'd been a communist in Germany, but they figured he'd put that behind him. And in any case, they wanted his brain. No one guessed that their shy, pale co-worker was capable of leading a double life. When I learned about the purpose of the work, Fuchs later said, I decided to inform Russia and I established contact through another member of the Communist Party. That led to Fuchs's contact with Ruth Werner. He and Werner met every couple of months on quiet rural roads. He passed her envelopes containing reports on everything British scientists knew about atomic bomb physics, and she radioed the material to Moscow. Once, Werner recalled, Klaus gave me a thick book of blueprints, more than a hundred pages long, asking me to forward it quickly. This obviously couldn't be done by radio. Like all experienced spies, Werner had backup plans in place. I had to travel to London, and at a certain time, in a certain place, drop a small piece of chalk and tread on it, she explained. This was a signal to her Soviet contact. It meant that a drop-off would be made at a prearranged time and place. Two days later, she got on her bicycle, with Fuchs's report hidden under her clothes. After about six or seven miles, I turned onto a site road, she said. There, parked under a tree, was a car. Behind the wheel sat a Soviet agent. I cycled on, hid my bike, and went to sit in the car beside him for a moment, Werner said. She handed over the papers, got back on her bike, and rode home. Important officials in Moscow said of Fuchs's information, very valuable. But it was of limited worth. Fuchs was doing interesting calculations, but the real action was taking place in the United States, and the Soviets were getting nothing at all from their agents in America. By the fall of 1942, this was making KGB officials in Moscow very angry. The organizational pace is entirely unsatisfactory, Moscow scolded its American spies. The project is taking a very long time to get going. In New York, Semon Semenoyev got the message. As part of his search for a way into the American bomb project, he turned to his best career, Harry Gold. One evening in New York City, Gold remembered, about October, November 1942, Semenoyev asked me if I'd heard anything of a military weapon. It was a bomb, Semenoyev said, a weapon of almost unimaginable power. I was puzzled, Gold said. I had no idea that anything was going on in that regard to atomic energy in the United States. Semenoyev knew it was a long shot, but he was desperate. He asked Gold to keep his eyes and ears open. Meanwhile, Moscow officials reminded their West Coast agents that they'd been sent a list of scientists to cultivate. Moscow was particularly annoyed that no contact had been made with Robert Oppenheimer. The Soviets had no way of knowing that Oppenheimer had just been named the scientific director of the American Atomic Bomb Project, but they knew he was a top American physicist. They knew it was probable he was involved. Peter Ivanov, a KGB agent in San Francisco, thought about how he could get close to Oppenheimer. As a Soviet agent, watched closely by the FBI, it would be too risky for him to make a direct approach. Ivanov went to see George Ellington, a chemical engineer known to be sympathetic to the Soviet Union. Ivanov pointed out to Ellington that the Americans and Soviets were allies in World War II, but the Soviets were the ones doing the fighting against Hitler. Why, Ivanov asked, was America keeping secrets from its ally? Ellington agreed. The Soviets deserved better. Ivanov then asked Ellington what he knew about atomic bomb research being done at the University of California, Berkeley. I personally, said Ellington, know very little of what's going on. Do you know any of the guys? asked Ivanov. Any others connected with it? Not very well, Ellington said. Ivanov tossed out names of well-known Berkeley physicists. Ernest Lawrence? Louis Alvarez? Robert Oppenheimer? Ellington said he knew Oppenheimer casually. They'd been to a few political meetings together over the years. 
Ivanov asked Ellington to talk with Oppenheimer to subtly feel out his interest in sharing information with the Soviets. Ellington said he didn't know Oppenheimer well enough to do it. Ivanov wouldn't give up. Wasn't there anyone Ellington knew who could be trusted to approach Oppenheimer? On thinking the matter over, Ellington remembered, I said that the only mutual acquaintance whom I could think of was Hakon Chevalier. Chevalier was a professor of French literature at Berkeley and the host of the communist discussion group at which Oppenheimer had been spotted by the FBI about two years earlier. Chevalier and Oppenheimer were good friends. Ellington asked Chevalier to approach his friend on behalf of the Soviets. Chevalier agreed. The perfect opportunity arose a few weeks later, when Robert and his wife Kitty invited Hakon and his wife Barbara over for dinner. Hakon was 100% in favor of finding out what Oppie was doing and reporting it back to Ellington, Barbara re remembered. Hakon also believed that Oppie would be in favor of cooperating with the Russians. Barbara strongly disagreed. They fought about it on, in the car on the way to dinner. As soon as the guests arrived, Oppenheimer announced it was time to mix a batch of his famous martinis. He walked toward the kitchen. Chevalier followed. As Oppenheimer began carefully pouring the liquor, a nervous-seeming Chevalier announced, I saw George Ellington recently. Oppenheimer looked up from his work. Chevalier continued, saying that Ellington had a contact with the Soviet intelligence. If Oppenheimer ever wanted to share any scientific information with the Soviets, he could use this connection. Oppenheimer was visibly disturbed by the suggestion. That would be a frightful thing to do, he said. That would be treason. Chevalier said nothing more. Oppenheimer went back to his martinis. That was the end of it, he later said. It was a very brief conversation. Chevalier reported the results to Ellington. A disappointed Ellington told Peter Ivanov, the FKGB agent, that there was no chance whatsoever of obtaining any data. Dr. Oppenheimer, Dr. Oppenheimer does not approve. Ivanov relayed the news to Moscow. Oppenheimer chose not to tell General Groves that he'd been approached by the Soviets. It was a decision that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Disappearing Scientists On the afternoon of November 16, 1942, Robert Oppenheimer and Leslie Groves stood together in a deep canyon in the northern New Mexico. Steep red rock cliffs rose on both sides of the canyon. A clear mountain stream trickled down the center. It was a gorgeous spot. This will never do, Groves grunted. The two men walked back toward their car. If you go up the canyon, Oppenheimer suggested, pointing east, you come out on top of the mesa, and there's a boys' school there which might be a usable site. The men climbed into the car and continued their search for the perfect place to build an atomic bomb lab. The site had to be remote, so work could be kept secret. It also had to be fairly close to railroad lines, so people and equipment could quickly move in and out. And ideally, it would have some buildings already in place, so scientists could move right in and get to work. A light snow began falling as the car wound its way up a narrow dirt road carved into the side of a mesa. A car reached the top and pulled up to a gate with a sign reading, Los Alamos Ranch School. From their car seats, Groves and Oppenheimer peered through the gate. We didn't want to get out, Groves remembered, as we should have had to have given some reason why we were inspecting the place. Inside the gate, boys ran around playing sports in the snow, in shorts. It was bitterly cold, recalls Groves, I thought they might thus be freezing. Beyond the playing fields were a few small school buildings, a dining lodge, log, log dormitories, and several small houses for teachers. Oppenheimer loved the mountain and desert views. Groves loved the isolation. This is the place, Groves said. A few weeks later, the school director opened an official-looking letter and saw that it was signed by Secretary of War Henry Stimson. You are advised, declared Stimson, that it has been determined necessary to the interest of the United States in the prosecution of the war that the property of Los Alamos Ranch School should be acquired for military purposes. The school was closed, the students sent home. While construction crews began expanding roads and nailing together new buildings at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer turned to his next task, next task a policy of absolutely unscrupulous recruiting of anyone we could lay hands on. A short while later, a Harvard University chemistry student named Donald Hornig was doing research in an explosives lab when the director walked in. Hornig's boss took him to the attic and locked the door. How would you like another job? asked the lab director. What have I done wrong? Hornig asked. Nothing, said his boss. What kind of job? 
Warnick wanted to know. Can't say. Well, where is it? Can't say. East or west? Sorry, my lips are sealed, said the director. Think it over and let me know in the morning. Warnick decided to turn the offer down. It sounded too strange. Then he started getting phone calls from former professors and the president of Harvard. They all wanted to know what his problem was. Didn't he realize his country needed him? He took the job. Similar scenes were taking place at top universities all over the country. People I knew well began to vanish, one after the other, Stanislaw Ullman, a mathematician at the University of Wisconsin, recalled. Then, Ullman got a letter inviting him to join a project doing important war work in New Mexico. Suddenly, he knew where everyone had gone. I accepted immediately, and with excitement and eagerness, he said. When the physicist Robert Marshank got a similar letter, he announced to his wife that they were leaving immediately. What's it all about? she asked. I can tell you nothing about it, he replied. We're going away, that's all. At least tell me where we are going away, she demanded. He refused. Only when they were halfway across the country did she find out they were headed for the southwest. Oppenheimer did a lot of recruiting personally. I traveled all over the country, he said, talking with people who had been working on one or another aspect of the atomic energy enterprise. It wasn't always easy to get them to sign on. The notion of disappearing into the New Mexico desert for an indeterminate period, he recalled, disturbed a good many scientists. And yet, Oppenheimer's offer did have an appeal. Almost everyone knew that if we were completed successfully and rapidly enough, it might determine the outcome of the war, he said. Almost everyone knew that this job would be part of history. The sense of excitement of devotion, and of patriotism pre prevailed. Most of those with whom I talked came to Los Alamos. Among those won over was a 24-year-old physics grad student named Richard Feynman. He was working in his room at Princeton University when, a burst, when in burst a young physics teacher named Bob Wilson. Wilson announced that he'd just been given a top-secret job. He wasn't supposed to tell anybody, Feynman remembered. But he was going to tell me because he knew that as soon as I knew what he was going to do, I'd see that I had to go along with it. The work, Wilson explained, had to do with uranium and fission and a whole new kind of bomb. There's a meeting at... I don't want to do it, Feynman cut in. All right, said Wilson. There's a meeting at three o'clock. I'll see you there. Wilson turned and left. I went back to work, Feynman said, for about three minutes. Then he got up and started pacing thinking about what little he knew about fission and the possibility of building atomic bombs. This would be very, very powerful weapon, he said, which, in the hands of Hitler and his crew, would let them completely control the rest of the world. He decided to go to the meeting. Soon after, Richard Feynman disappeared from the Princeton campus.